really pleased to be welcoming uh, Sekramati to this Sarah Mike this evening. So what we're going to do is I'm going to uh, interview Sekramati for about 40 minutes. So I'm going to be uh, asking him not not tricky questions. It's not it's not it's not a gotcha. You can do that at the end if you want to ask him tricky like questions. Yeah, tricky questions are good. But I'm going to what I'm going to be really trying to do is. Uh, We'll draw out different aspects of Sagamati's life and character. You know, obviously Sagamati has been uh, practicing Buddhism ordained for a long, long time, 40 years, more than 40, 45. 45 years. So there's so many different things he could talk about, stories he could tell. So in a way, the advantage of the interview format is that I can just kind of like I'm just going to jump around. I'm going to, I, like I will provide structure, so I'll kind of jump for a bit. So I'll get some to talk about something for a bit, and then I'll say, okay, let's go over here. Uh, so there's because there's a, a number of key areas of Sacramento's life which I'm keen to evoke for all of you because I think he's got a lot to communicate. So that's the basic format. I'm going to kind of, I'm going to broadly speaking, with major jumps, kind of chart the trajectory of Sacramento's life practicing Buddhism. There's three key, three key areas which I'm least which I'm keen to evoke and ask about. But before we get on to that, I'll just say a little bit about, um, in a way you're going to hear a lot more about Sagramati, but just a couple of good things. So Sagramati's my name means he who has a mind like the ocean. So this is a, it's a really lovely name. Those of you, some of you know Sagramati quite well, some of you have never met him before. So in a way, his, the ocean-like nature of his mind is going to manifest over the next hour. Um, but it's just something, yeah, was, uh, the Buddha used the analogy of the ocean when it, well, it's one of his most, one of his uh, metaphors he used. And just for some way, what, a couple of ways in which Sacramati's mind is like an ocean. One of them is very, very vast. So the ocean is vast, but it's also deep. So Sagamati's had a lot of experience. He knows a lot about a lot of things, but there's also a lot of depth to his experience. He's really looked into things deeply. He really wants to understand um, things deeply. So there's, there's breadth and depth. The other thing about the ocean is that you never quite know what you're going to get. The ocean is <laughs> mysterious and strange and, and stormy at times. And it's one of the things I really like about Sagramati is his willingness to, well, say what he really thinks. So I'm sure you'll get a taste of that as well this evening. And so just one last thing I want to say before we start. In a way, just this is a more general thing, celebrating the nature of the true Latin Buddhist community. So I first met Sagamati just over 20 years ago. Mm. Don't know if you remember the sort of retreat where you ordained Chandra. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So one of the wonderful things about True Ratna is because it's it's like a worldwide movement, but it's also quite a small movement. So I remember meeting Sagamati 20 years ago. Mm. And not like if you normally you meet people 20 years ago, you never, you just like, you forget about them, but actually there's this kind of, there's this opportunity for continuity of connection. So we've been, so 20 years ago, we didn't become friends then, but then in 2006, I lived with Sarkomati for several years, and that was really the point in which we became friends. So that's 15 years ago. So we've been friends for over 15 years now. And that's, that friendship has taken different kind of shapes and you know, stages and byways, depending on what both of us have been up to. So I'm really hoping that this evening we can, I can, uh, well, do a good job of asking Sagramati questions where you can kind of get a sense of, so in, well, in 20 years time, you can think, oh yeah, I, Sagramati, I remember meeting him for the first time, I remember what he said. That's my hope. I'm not used to this format, so I've, I've never interviewed anybody before, so apologies for any. Neither am I. Yeah, so, yeah, so this is a bit of a journey of exploration for both of us, but I'm sure we'll do fine. So let's begin. So first of all, Sacramati, I just wanted, um, in a way, just so I'm going to, I'm going to kind of chart, you know, like I'm going to take mm. several key moments from the, like your, your Buddhist life. Mm. So of course, the first moment to ask about is, what is it? Well, what were you doing just before you got into Buddhism? And what, what? No, maybe even to go back before that. What? just kind of chart a few of the things that were going on in your life before you got into Buddhism and what's, and can you see, are there threads of those aspects which drew you into practicing Buddhism? Does that make sense? Well, I was uh, brought up as a Catholic, oh. um, but I think about the age 11, I, uh, 
In those days, the only news you get, you go to the cinema and you're path in news. And I saw the um, Auschwitz stuff and all that, and I thought, what kind of being mm. creates a world like this? Mm. I remember sort of coming up from school and putting my little fist in, I said, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing happened, so I thought, oh. Um, so this was so God didn't exist, this was you having the... Yeah, this yeah. Was, um, well, I'm not sure when he existed, but uh, I didn't like him very much. <laughs> um, so I sort of gave up. I was a kind of atheist, I suppose. Mm. But I always thought there was something in the cosmos. Um, you know, it's sort of yeah. So I was, you know, I was in the Royal Navy for, what, nearly eight years. Um, and being on submarines, you get a lot of time to think. You don't see much. <laughs> yeah, but you get a lot of time to think. But um, one of the things that kept me in touch with what was going on that side was um, music. Oh, right. So he used to listen to Grateful Dead and all mm. that stuff, all the hippie stuff. Yeah. And uh, so I bought myself out of the Navy. Uh, they were a bit reluctant because they trained me as an electronics technician and I spent a lot of time on it. So I bought myself, it cost 300 pounds. Wow. And that was the first time I did a three figure sum of money. Yeah. Um, and what year was this? This was the 60s somewhere. 1969. 69, yeah. yeah. Um, so I just wanted to do this thing called LSD. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I come out, I got a good job as a computer engineer. But I ended up in London. And the company I worked with, it was quite good in those days. So the first six months, you just lived in hotels. You know, so I was in Paddington, and the, the six months was going to go. I got the London Evening News. The flat chair, and I was around the corner in the last terrace in Bayswater. And the first question they asked, Do you smoke dope? I said, Yeah. <laughs> so I must admit, it was like a community, which oh. put everything together. Oh, um, there was one girl, she was a school teacher, she, her boyfriend was a manager of the Rolling Stones, okay. who okay. got stuck in America because of the, uh, the, the murder or whatever. And then he was uh, manager of the Grateful Dead, one wow. of this kind of thing. And the other two were Australians, mm. uh, school teachers. Um, and when, that, when I was there, I discovered books. Like, mm. They were, had books on, uh, um, what do you call them? Um, Suzuki, oh, yeah. uh, things like that. Kind of new and, age. Um, yeah, yeah, and um, no, it was all. But it's all stuff. Okay. And um, I remember looking at a book and I thought, wow, this is what life's about. Oh. And that's what me. Yeah. I thought this is life about. So um, I ran around places in um, in London, and it's mm. mainly Thai mm. or uh, Sri Lankan or mm. Sinhalese. Um, but they had heard about Mahayana, so you know I didn't want the law, so I don't know. So eventually I found out about um, Sami Ling. Mm. So Sami Ling was the first Tibetan center in Europe, mm. uh, up in uh, what was it on the border? What is that? Uh, what is it called? Uh, Langham. Yeah. I think it's called Langham. Yeah. Uh, and he had a place in the country. Mm. So I went there. Mm. Um, so this was your first retreat you went on? Well, there wasn't really a retreat. You, um, you, there was a couple of Tibetan movies there and yeah. things like that. And then Akon, he was the, the head man. Yeah. Um, so he said, what do you know about meditation? So I was reading uh, Philip Catherine's Three Cars of Zen. Yeah. And he said, well, just do that. Yeah. Um, so I really loved it because it was a nice big room and it had a big, lovely Akhmenser carpet and there was an American uh, bhikkhu, uh, Tibetan bhikkhu, and another guy and he used to just do this chanting a bit and the chanting, they get louder and louder and then they'd be there, so that's a simple, then it would all go quiet. I just loved it, you know. Um, um, so did you think you were a Buddhist at this point or were you kind of checking it out? No, I was thinking, I was, I was, yeah, yeah. I definitely felt that. But the funny thing was, um, when I got the bus back from London to uh, Victoria Station in London, um, I was totally blistered. Oh. I was blistered for five days and nothing else. Yeah. And I was looking at this Argentine girl and she said, gee, Bob, you haven't shouted to me all week. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it died away. I talked about my bantha and he said, I'll begin to oh. He said, I think you've just exhausted your good karma. <laughs> um, so eventually, uh, when I was in Sunday then I asked somebody about it. I said, well, is anything in London? And he said, oh, does he have to leave you hmm. He said, you like it there, we're all dope heads. That's what he said. Yeah, so I eventually went up. 
And that was the routine doing the meditation. You had a joint first, yeah. got the bus up and went to the meditation class. Yeah. Um, and it was definitely, I was lucky because the first class I went to, um, I think it was under Bhante's last or second last club, so mm. I had Bhante. Mm. Um, then I got to know people like, well, none of us were on danger, like yeah. Sigurd and all that. Okay. So in my little where I was living in baseball, Sigurd had come down and talked to me, going to join the community yeah. in Oswell Hill. Okay. Um, and the good thing about that was, like, when Bhante came back from his sabbatical, yeah. uh, he used to stay there. Because he was still kind of paying the rent. Yeah. yeah. So just to pause for a second. So Bante's for the kind of for, for those of you aren't familiar is for, for uh, like for, for familiar name for Sangal actually the person who founded True Atlas. Mm. So just tell us a little bit, because of course most of you have never met uh Sangal actually we died even before you came to the British Centre. So just for a minute, so Kumati, what your so your first few experiences of meeting Sangal Ashtra mm. Bante, what what kind of struck you about him? What mm. what was he like? Well, the I remember the first class I went to, that what struck me about him was like, um, it was hard to put. Um, yeah. It asked me in Germany about it. I said, uh, they're like Geist, oh. you know, German thing. It's a bit like, um, there was incredible calmness oh. yeah. and unflutteredness. Mm. And there was just somebody who was there. Mm. That's a, I've heard that with Bhante a few times. He was just all present. Mm. Yeah. Um, um, and, and how did that affect you? Um, well, I didn't see him again for another year. <laughs> okay. But we were lucky because he comes to London, he stays with us. Oh, yeah. So we used to have him for dinner. But yeah. I remember the first time I had dinner with him, I thought, we were the guru. And I thought, oh my God, he could see what I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> and could he? After that, no. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say anything anyway. Um, so um, the next step then was, uh, well, we got ordained, City Rana got ordained, I got ordained, mm. and we had the Louvre. So mm. this is interesting because um, we've all got Pali and Sanskrit names, but uh, at one stage he said uh, he was going to try and do Celtic names, because we, why should we have Indian names? Mm. Uh, and Louvre was the only person who got a non-Indian name, but Louvre is um, William Blake, you know William Blake? Yeah. And there's this mystical park of four zoos, and Louvre is one of the four zoos. Yeah. And uh, so he was called. And do you have a sense of why he didn't? He went back to giving people uh, like traditional Buddhist names and didn't continue with. Uh, well, that was called the, well, like an ISO call, like the Western and Buddhist. Buddhist. Yeah. yeah, it's what was about it was it was West. Yeah, and Bhante was. Giving talks like highly yeah. evolution and yeah. something like that. Yeah. It was all very Western. Yeah. And the, when I asked him what books I should read, he said, or oh, Plato and things like that. Yeah. So that's what I was interested in. Yeah. Um, but the next step was um, uh, well, we had all the Bantis lectures. Mm. Uh, Ananda, who was a BBC engineer at that mm. time, he recorded them on a professional recorder. Yeah. I got the idea of. Um, well, why can't we put them on cassette and sell them? Okay. So we made a little booklet up and Bandy bred it through a correct old grammar or something like that. So we started a little business. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then Bandy then started doing, uh, he, he hadn't done any lectures in the public for years. Mm -hmm. So he did the first lecture was on enlightenment as experience and non experience. And he, Christmas Humphreys had fallen up with Bhante. Christmas Humphreys was the guy in the, in the um, British Society in um, Bruce, near Victoria Post Station. Um, and that was the centre of a lot of things. Um, you know, if you weren't interested in going along to a Thai centre or whatever, you went there. Yeah. Um, so Bhante was making, they were making up. Because mm. uh, Christmas Humphreys said that we were the, the main force of the Dharma in the West, in, in, in England. In, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so that, I got on a new thing, because Bunny started doing talks, mm. I recorded them, yeah. he started doing 10 day seminars. Mm. Uh, there was one place called Ness, what well, that was a house was called in the South Downs. So we had three 10 day seminars, one after the other, with two days in between. Then mm. there was, I was there all the time, and Sona was there, because he was the organizer. And um, so we did attend a seminar on the Dharma, um, Door of Liberation, yeah. and uh, Jhana for Beginners. Mm -hmm. They were talking like that. So just, I'm going to 
jump yeah. forward for a little bit. But so, because this is often seen as being one of Sankarachita's most kind of like kind of prolific periods of his life, and yeah. you know, kind of delivering all these teachings. So, can you kind of just evoke a bit more? What what impact had did that did those teachings have on you? Like, was it did you feel like you learned things, or was it more like an experience of hearing somebody communicating? Or well, a lot was bunting when well, he communicated. Um, but like the Udana, I mean, um, I didn't bother with the Pali kind of thing. Yeah. Like that. When we did the Udana, I just had to change my mind. Yeah. Um, and the thing was, um, I mean, in those days, we only had one centre in North London, Brent yeah. Weaker. Um, there was another little community in Purley, mm. uh, Aria Loka, Aria, yeah. Aria Tyler. Aria Tyler. Aria Tyler. Yeah. Um, so there were no chapter meetings, there was just an order meeting. Yeah. It was on the Friday night. Yeah. Um, and sometimes Monty would come. Right. But I'll give you an example. But this is rather rude and things like that, especially the way the world is now. Um, and that's what I did. The first retreat I did yeah. was um, with um, it was in Lokum at his father's house. He was a professor in Cambridge. Yeah. So we went to, we had the house to ourselves. Yeah. And it was the first retreat, and it was like um, getting up at four in the morning, silence and all this sort of stuff. It was really hard. Yeah. Um, but th this is when the gender thing came in, because yeah. um, beginners are mixed, but once you're no longer a beginner, there are separate retreats. Mm. Um, and we were talking about Bhante, I didn't know, I didn't know what homosexual was. <laughs> and um, I said to Bhante, well, well there's some, you've got these um, separate retreats. I said, so what about gay people? What, what do they go on? I said, maybe have a retreat on their own. I said, maybe the, the, the gay men should go to women's retreats. And this is still recorded, you can read that. Damn it, then I said, no, we don't want any boothers on our retreat. <laughs> so this is how it was, man. It's very changing world. Um, but I just got more and more contact with Dante. Mm. Yeah. And um, one day he said to me, oh, so it was after um, Shepherd's Search for Mind. And, mm. uh, one of the older members, he was a lecturer. Dirtbed College in London, mm. and he had a, him and his wife, they had a, a kind of a couple of buildings in the Tetford Forest. Mm. Right? Um, so we used to use that. Uh, and Shepherd Search for Mind, that's a famous one. Mm. And, and after it was finished, he said to me, Salvador, he said, uh, You've got a good feeling for the Dharma, you should take it off. I'm mm. not an engineer, I'm an electronics engineer. You know, I don't mind doing the tapes and recording. Mm. <laughs> so I said, They put me on that. Yeah. So I started doing, um, I had bounty tapes on the 10 day seminars. So I started doing 10 day seminars, but mm -hmm. this is using the notes and mm -hmm. things are taken off. With mm -hmm. So that's how I started. Really. Yeah. So I'm just going to, like, I could ask you about this, but I want to jump forward a bit. So there's a, this kind of crucial point in not so long later on where you go to Bante and say to him, What should I do? And he says, I'll go to university. Yeah, mm -hmm. So just tell us a bit about why, what you, so that, that kind of, that, that was a major turning point in yeah. your life, really, yeah. where you started getting, you know, you've just alluded to this, where you're getting more and more kind of trying to really, like, understand the Dharma deeply. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about what, what about, what inspired you to do that, to kind of, to, to really, mm -hmm. to kind of try and understand what the Buddha actually said as deeply as Well, Bhante just thought I'd do it. Well, when you give me my name, yeah. the Marty bit was uh, the thinking bit, was yeah. it? Right? But you said you have a very broad interest. Mm. So, the the, the uh, cyber bit. Yeah. Um, and I know that Ratna Guna told me that Pandi said, when, when, because I started with Manchester with the centre, yeah, that was another yeah. thing. Uh, and Pandi said to Ratna Guna, I don't want Sagramati involved in any institutional things. Mm. He has to be free to study. Yeah. Um, but then after Manchester, like, we got the centre up and running. Mm. Uh, I was quite lucky. I went to the Manchester with John Lord kit, yeah. uh, 25 pounds in my pocket, that was it, you know, and Bunty's lectures. But we just signed on the door those days, nobody bothered it. Mm. Yeah. But once we got the centre up and running, we did classes and all that, and um, I just lost it. I said, no, I'm not. Bunty said, are you going to be the chair or not? I said, no, I'm not interested. Mm. And he said, so look at it, took me to India. Because mm. local literature had started things in India. He was a yoga teacher mm. and used to go down at the Iyengar place in Pune. Mm. But when he was out there, he met a few of Bhante's old friends when he was in India. So local literature started 
to India. <laughs> so he asked me to come out for a year, mm. and it was only him and Purna. Purna is another order member. He's in Australia. Yeah, he was in New, New Zealand. Mm. And me. But there was only about seven order members uh, in India. Mm. Yeah. It's a big country. Yeah. But, um, so when I come back, so what do I do? Uh, I was going to go to Australia. Yeah. And Bhante talked me out of it. He said, oh, there's nothing for you to do out there. Leave it for another year and come on the Tuscany retreat. Mm. So um, when people were getting ordained in those days, uh, we hired this ex convent in uh, Il Convento, it was called, yeah, near Grosseto in, in Italy. Um, so uh, that, um, he said, uh, Go to Australia next year, and I'll be ready. So I had a year and I worked for French Foods and all that stuff. Um, and then after Tuscany, I came back and I thought, what could I do? So I had a choice of um, joining the Padmaloka team mm. or going to Aritara with uh, Padmaraja before mm. all that stuff happened. Or Vajradipa, you remember mm. Vajradipa? He's a friend of mine. Uh, he was doing a course at King's College in London on um, religious studies. Yeah. And he was, he said, oh, you know, it's really great. So that's what I did. I had to get an A-level. I went down there and said, because I, I left school in Scotland, I mean, I was a, you know, didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I just had a school certificate. So, um, so I did an A-level on my own. Yeah. I got a B. <laughs> and so I went down to see Fred Hardy. He was a, he would have been my supervisor in King's College. And he said, okay. So I started. Yeah. And um, I felt I come into my world because yeah. in those days, um, I mean, you did stay eight modules and um, through the years, three years. Uh, so when you get the term, there's no semesters yet, there are terms. And you go, go in and there's a couple of modules you're doing and you've got uh, four or five essay titles and, that, and that's all you did. You, you decided, you just did essays. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the semester, or whatever, uh, you got, you went to see the tutor and he went through it with you. Mm -hmm. And I still love it. Mm -hmm. I still love it. So, <laughs> So and just to tell me a bit more, because at that point you would, that was a, like a, a general study of philosophy. Yeah. So and then, so did, and what impact did studying philosophy have on your relationship with Buddhism? Did it strengthen your confidence in Buddhism? Did it change it? Yeah, but it changes your outlook on it. Oh, so tell us more about that. Um, no, there wasn't actually, I mean, uh, there was eight modules. Okay. Yeah, you had to do two religions, sure. Shadi Buddhism. Yeah. And Islam. Yeah. So they were only a small part of that. Sure. Yeah. Um, so the, the Buddhist stuff is quite straightforward, mm. actually. Dharavada, um, Mahayana, and things yeah. like that. So, so I suppose I'm, I'm fishing for something because when we've talked about this in the past, you, you said that studying like studying academic belief changed your relationship with Buddhism. So what well, it wasn't just say Buddhism, it was uh, religion. I okay. realised religions are creations of human beings. <laughs> that was the thing. Yeah. Because um, I was interested in the Christian background, and not, uh, not the churches, but the kind of more philosophical. Okay. Stuff, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, um, the, the Buddhist bit came when I... Because what first I went and did a PhD. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And that was more and more interesting. And I was trying to Western Buddhism fit things together. Mm. So I could either do Schopenhauer or Nietzsche and Buddhism. Mm. And I thought Schopenhauer would be straightforward, but yeah. Nietzsche, because Bhante did a lecture on Nietzsche. Yeah. I was reading, well, one of the guys used to come in the community in Bayswater. Yeah. He used to come in and he had this Nietzsche book and he said, oh, you must read this, you know, so I, I was a bit, but I used to, I did find it a bit Nietzsche, a bit, well, how do you interpret this man, ah. right? On the one hand, he seems like an iconoclast, hmm. but on the other, he seems to have something. Hmm. So um, I did a piece on Nietzsche and books on it. Yeah. So, so I just got all Nietzsche's books, I put them down in front of me, and I started with this one. And I just read through and wrote notes because there's no computers. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 um, well, it, I got stuck after uh, three and a half years. And uh, I went to, and said, look, I want to finish. I want to go be a school teacher in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. That's wrong. And um, it was Vipassi. Mm -hmm. Well, he wasn't Vipassi then. But, uh, he looked it through, he said, there's a PhD. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
they're not going to lose to you. <laughs> and so this is a big question, so I'm going to ask you to be succinct here. So if you, if you had to summarise in just a few minutes the relationship between nature and Buddhism, what would you say? Or what's, what's um, interesting or relevant? Well, the thing was that um, Nietzsche's main theme was the death of God. Right. Yeah. Um, and he saw that. He didn't, it wasn't God like the, the, the being. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the whole of Western culture, because oh. the whole of Western culture, whether you're Christian or not, um, the kind of culture it is influenced by the ethics, etc. It's influenced by Christianity. Yeah, for sure. And what Nietzsche fears is the death of God. It'll take a, it could take a millennia to you know, feel the through. But he thinks we turn into a, well, Thatcher, not a bit Thatcher. Right. Because um, he thinks most human beings, they never raise their, what it, they use their consciousness to seek what the animal seeks through instinct. Oh. To that extent, a vast number of human beings never read their horizon beyond those of an animal. Because oh. yeah. they do the same thing. So, it's, so he's, his concern is kind of materialism, and you're just trying to get, you know, like a, a well, nicer job, a bigger house, blah, blah, blah. Well, he, he did think that even in the past, Christians, some of them had uh, evolved to some oh. degree, they worked on themselves. So that was his thing. Mm. How, you know, human beings, uh, how do they raise themselves above those of an animal, mm. basically? Yeah. yeah. And that's when he got interested in Buddhism. Yeah, because there's an obvious power yeah. in that. Yeah. But um, he had, um, so he was f fearful of that the society would just become nihilist. Yeah. Right. But eventually, there was two kinds of nihilism active and passive. Mm. And he, early on, um, saw Buddhism as a passive nihilism. He thinks what the Buddha did was he realized that there's no such thing as a god, all the values we have, they're all our creation. Mm -hmm. um, and so what the Buddha says, well, what's the meaning in life? And the, the, he thought the Buddha said, well, there's no meaning in life. There's just none. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but what he did was he, he created a system where people could live happily and die cheerfully in a universe without any meaning. <laughs> That's what he thought. So, and, and presumably you would not completely agree with that. So what would you say? If that, so if that's what Nietzsche's position is, what would you say is in a more accurate, or what's the Buddhist position in relation to that? Well, ultimately, we don't know. Okay. <laughs> we don't know what, what an awakened being is. Right? Um, but the thing is, Nietzsche started talking in a way mm. that could have been used as Buddhist uh, practice. Oh, yeah. Like he says things like um, a gardener, he said, what we don't know is a gardener. Like he said, you, you're free to sort of change yourself. Mm. You can cut out the weeds and you can develop here and there. Yeah. He said, but nobody knows they can do this. They mm. can treat themselves like a, like a gardener treats them. Yeah. You know, flowers and all the rest of it. So again, that would be a strong parallel because that's what Buddhism is saying, isn't it? Yeah. You know, you can consciously grow. You can't yeah. be sure how you do it or where it ends up. Yeah. yeah. But he, he, um, there's quite a few things in Nietzsche on that. Yeah. What's he call it? Self-overvindum. Self-overcoming. Okay. So that's what you have to do. So, um, and as the villas were marked, the world of power. Yeah. I think Bandit got that wrong as well. Yeah. Bandit said in some picture, the world of power has nothing to do with violence. It's for everything. Yeah. Right down to an atom. Yeah. There's a kind of niceness to go further, yeah. you know. To grow. Yeah, to grow, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah well, but... you have evolution, that's why Bhante thought. The um, notion of evolution, he said, if that concept had been around in his day, he would have used it. Uh -huh. But that changed it, he had a higher evolution of man, that changed it to the further evolution. And we have to change a man now, so oh. we say men's because it includes but... So I'm gonna, so I'm gonna jump you on again now. So, um, so, cause that's, so you've been, in like consistently trying to deeply study and understand the Dharma for decades mm -hmm. now. So coming much more into the, into the present, I, I suppose I'm curious to hear, what do you feel, what do you feel like you've learned from those, it's, it's got to be like 30 years or something mm -hmm. like that. So what do you feel like you've learned from these 30 years of studying Buddhism? Um, well, maybe often the people who meet me these days, I, I went on one of an Aliyah's retreat. I think oh. he's got really something. Mm. Um, there's another book called Yonananda, he died mm. a couple of years ago, but um, I mean, like, 
I used to predict it's something part of is the set essence of Buddhism, mm. right? And uh, you've got the um, so just to pause for because some of the not FB knows the predictions have a part of do you want to just give a like a, a, a quick yeah. summary for some of the people who aren't well, familiar with it? Goes back to the Buddha's awakening, mm. right? Um, and the Buddha saw that everything arises in dependence on conditions, mm. and when the conditions change, it ceases. So everything, everything is impermanent. Mm. And the real problem is we rely on these things and they're impermanent. <laughs> And and that's what suffering comes from. Dukkha. Yeah. But, um, dukkha is, I mean, even Bhikkhu Bodhi and all that, he, he's not that, he gets things wrong. Dukkha is to be unawakened. Mm. So the highest God to live for billions of years and all that, mm. it's all Dukkha. So Dukkha is to be unawakened. But everybody translates it as suffering. Mm. But what the, up in the papers and all that, you're in the Arupa Jamas, it's Dukkha. Mm. And it's, you know, yeah. it's like, we, we, that's the thing about reading a lot. You, um, you get a bit more than you get in the room. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. So, so you just said that, so what would you, what, what translation would you favour for Dukkha if you, if you said, so suffering isn't quite right? Oh, you just use the word Dukkha okay. and explain. Yeah. Well, you've got the three kinds of Dukkha. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so what you're saying is, so, so Dukkha, it's, it's not direct suffering, it's more like well, it's like dissatisfaction or yeah. it's like, it's it's good, but it's not as good as it yeah. could be or... But this is another thing, because Dukkha, there's a sutta called the Penetrative Sutta, and I got this from Yamananda. Yeah. And uh, the Buddha says, um, what is the outcome of Dukkha, yeah. the result of Dukkha? And the monk's not saying, it says, well, there's two. Um, you can either get totally involved in all the samsaric things, mm. or you can go on a search for an end to Dukkha. Mm. And that's why in the 23 Nadalas, the yeah. it's, it's, it's in the middle. Mm. Yeah. Dukkha is also samsara, but without Dukkha, there'd be no spiritual life. Yeah. So this is one of the things which I really appreciate about my friendship with you, is this emphasis on... Um, it's it's it, like it feels what one of the things I consistently feel like I get from you is it's like we can have this romantic notion of life being easy. Life isn't easy, but you do strongly evoke this sense. But it is possible to change, and the, the mechanism is mysterious. But we can we can influence the unfolding of our lives. Yeah. But the thing with um, this is because it's called the Upanishad Sutta. Isn't no. it? You need to know the grammar to explain it. But basically. And that was fine. We talked about Monty. Well, the, you know, the dependent rising, it seems a bit mechanical. Oh, yeah. Um, but this, that sort of we do, the 23, there's a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, the, the key term is Upanisa. Um, so we say, uh, like, independence on Dukkha arises, uh, people say faith, I call it confidence, yeah. You know, sure yeah. Right. But the thing is, with Upanisa, you take away the word, the usual word is conditioned. Uh-huh. Upanishad means something different. So, uh, in association with dukkha, mm. this can arise. Uh-huh. Yeah. It doesn't say it will. Yeah. Right? So it takes out the kind of deterministic yeah. way that Pratita Samapada is presented. Yeah. Yeah. It's so kind it's, of it's, it's a mystery why yeah. some of how how did human beings come about? How did animals and flowers and fish come about? We have no idea. Yeah. But somehow or other, it happened. Yeah. So this is um, so this is some idea. Of, sorry. Yeah. Well, the, the technical term is emergence. Yeah. And I got that at the university. Yeah. Okay. So this so if, if you're if you're if you're if you're if you're listening to it, you're thinking, oh, I'm not quite following this. This idea of this this mystery that it's possible to move from yeah dukkha to confidence. This is I think this is from you've, you've this has been such a recurring thread for you for such a long time, but I think it's such an important thing yeah. to hear. Yeah. yeah. But even if you get confidence, because it makes more sense. If you're not confident, you can't get any further. Ah. But you can always go all the way up to um, northern division of things as they are. Yeah. You can fall back. Yeah. yeah. You could be in a, a mystical state and think you've arrived. Mm. Yeah. But maybe you haven't. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well, how do we know? It's like uh, 
like in the Zen tradition or whatever, or the Chan in China, the master was the one who decided whether you'd got into it or not. Yeah. But we don't, we just have people deciding they've got it. Yeah. Yeah. Which is so good. So I think she'd forget about that and just get on breakfast. Yeah. But this is, it's, again, I'm just kind of, because it feels to me that, as I say, one of the things I feel like I've really got from you in my friendship is this. Um, well, it, it's, it's in my friendship with you, it's funny. So, like, my obviously, there's a you know, you're quite a lot old for me. One of the things I observe is, is it's like the young tend to want certainty, yeah. and one of the things I really get from you is, is a confidence which isn't but but it, which is open to the fact that we're not yeah. sure. Yeah. And I, that's something I really so hopefully you'll kind of get me that because I think that's a yeah. really important thing to learn. Um, I think it was that notion of emergence I picked yeah. up in a course we did on science and religion. Oh, yeah. And when it hit it, I just thought, this is pretty sort of hard. Yeah. Um, but I agree with that. Um, life is a mystery. Mm. I mean, anyway, go back to LSD. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, what I had heard somebody had taken the LSD and said, God, and I thought, no, they just saw the, the mystery of the cosmos. Yeah. And, I, I think it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you you don't get tied down to one thing. No. Yeah. And and that's and that's another characteristic. Well, this is the ocean like characteristic for your mind. You're just quite open. It's like, oh, I'm not sure. Actually. Yeah. Am I drunk? Yeah. But you might also meet an amazing turtle and go on a crazy journey. And, you know. Well, yeah. yeah. No, I always think like that. I like um, when I was a kid. Um, because like living in Dundee at the time, a lot, there was no electricity, all, all the street lamps were the gas. Oh, yeah. And I used to get, uh, the most religious experience I have is watching uh, Patrick Moore the sky at night. Oh. To me, it's like, uh, whoa. So I got this, he used to get these little booklets, uh, sp spy books, spy oh. the sky. And I used to go into the dark, where it was yeah. dark, and I'd look at all the stars and not in the dark and stuff like that. I mean, I remember the headmaster at my primary school said, what do you want to be? I want to be a spaceman. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're kind of a spaceman. You're a spaceman of consciousness, aren't you? Well, yeah. sometimes. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah. Maybe you're right sometimes. So, uh, so maybe you can tell us, so, because you've read a lot, a lot, a lot of different mm -hmm. Buddhist teachings and Buddhist stories. So can you maybe tell us a little bit about what your, if you had to choose one of your favourite Teachings of the Bajor Sutras. If you could just tell us, just kind of tell us a story. One of the just one of the, one of your favourite sutras. What is it, and what do you love um, about it? Well, I like the Garava Sutta. So come on, because so um, these, these good people were before. Well, the Garava Sutta. Garava means uh, reverence, and respect. Yeah. Yeah. So the, it's after the Buddha has been awakened, mm. and uh, the Buddha thinks, um, "What is he thinking of?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's not nice not to have somebody to look up to, basically, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. And he says, well, are there any, is there any beings in the universe I could thank for this awakening that happened to me? And he looks around and said, there's none. And then he says, well, what have I, what, what he decided that he would live um, in reverence to the Dharma? Mm. Yeah, so... And the Dharma was not the teaching because he hadn't said anything, but he said that it allows Gandhi about it. He says, um, you could call it that aspect of the cosmos mm. that makes Buddhahood possible. Mm. Right? And I, I love that. Yeah. Thought, you know. So just say that for his again, that aspect of the cosmos. Aspect, because the Buddhists, uh, how did this come about? Mm. You get this story about uh, watching them. I've heard this story, I thought. Because um, I think when the Buddha, he'd exhausted everything India had to offer. Mm. You know, he did all the meditation stuff, he got into the higher jhanas, mm. he did the ascetic stuff and nearly killed himself. Mm. So when he sat under the Bodhi tree, he was at a loss. Mm. He's bewildered. Yeah. But um, there's another sutta, uh, was it in the Ajimitaka? And the Buddha talks about when Upadana in the 12 Madanas is mm. grasping. No. Um, but the, the thing is, grasping goes all the way through the whole even mm. to the higher reaches of yeah. Shaksapa. Yeah. And there's one called Upadana Seta. And Seta's a chief. Oh. Right. Um, but the Buddha says, but you know, you're just as far from awakening as you would be if you're in a Yeah. So um, so you can imagine the Buddha's done all that. 
but he was still this bit of cleaning uh, and somehow dropped it. Uh, and when he dropped it, that was the condition. Yeah. That's, that's what I imagine. Yeah. That's what I imagine. So, and that cycles back to this sense, you know, this, yeah, this theme, of, <coughs> and from, theme of a mystery and yeah. kind of like, what does, what's it like? Yeah. We don't know. But... So, a bunch thing was like, um, in that aspect of the cosmos that makes Buddhahood possible. Yeah. So, the Buddha still, he, he wasn't thinking, I'm fantastic, I'm broken. It was like, how did this happen uh, to me? Yeah. And so, Given the Indian conditioning, everybody is a guru. Mm. And so his, he was still looking for somebody to look up to and say, did you do this to me or what? Yeah. So he just realized it was, it's just the Dharmakaya. Mm. Not the Dharmakaya, there's no such thing as Dharmakaya. Yeah. And what do you call it? Um, Dharma. The Dharma Nira, which comes in late. Yeah. Um, and so what's it, what is it about that story that you like so much? The mystery. The mystery, yeah, yeah. yeah. But the Buddha had exhausted everything. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you said he was at a loss, and that, that, that's what I think. Yeah, it? and that feels that felt like that felt that was quite important to you. That, um, yeah. yeah. Well, I got that from uh, this guy called Pyro, mm. Pyro, we say Pyro. Mm. So he um, he went with Alexander to India. His, his teacher was a Democritian, don't they? Yeah. Um, but they were away for 11 years. Yeah. So this is 500 BC Greek uh, yeah. philosophers. Yeah. yeah. So tell us about yeah. And um, Well, he, he seemed to have met Buddhists. Wow. Because they were four years stationary on the border with India. Wow. And they met, you know, they had, what do you call them, junior sophists? Though, yeah. So naked ascetics. Um, but when Pyro came back, uh, <laughs> as far as we can figure out, he taught. Mm. Um, it's called, he's a skeptikos. Mm. So skeptikos, it means to inquire in Greek. Oh. So basically you inquire mm. and you inquire and inquire until you get stimmied. Mm. And stimmied, so you mean stuck. Stuck, yeah, yeah really stuck. Um, and then uh, it goes into, well, what happened like when somebody was painting a horse and the horse had been in a race. Mm. So he's trying to paint the froth on the mouth and it's sort of fine and he tries and tries and guides. And in the end, he takes his rag and throws it in the thing. And there it is. Nice. And they say this sudden awakening is just like that. It's yeah. totally unpredictable. Mm. But it arises dependence upon effort because he he yeah. didn't try yeah, you have to do it. You have to try. And then the mystery emerges. Yeah. So, so that sounds uh, again just coming back to so, as I said, I've been friends with psychometry a long time, and this that that kind of some that to me quite. Acute succinctly summarizes your attitude to things like you, you really put yourself into things, mm -hmm. you really try to understand the Dharma very, very deeply, but you're also kind of like, oh, yeah, but it's just a mystery. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, yeah, I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Well, it can get a bit too heavy if oh, you, yeah. Don't, yeah. you don't open up to that. Yeah. Well, and, and, and kind of false certainty, but I think that's, yeah, that's a real concern of yours is sort of like naive false certainty is better to be it's more honest you know you, it seems to me you've got a real desire for honesty and it's more honest to say i don't know than mm. to say i know when you don't yeah. yeah i think that's um one of the things that you teach you have to do yeah because if you're given a lecture or whatever and somebody asks a question and or you know you, you might argue with them and uh, just be honest and say i don't know yeah. I think that's what you should say, rather than defend your... Oh, yeah. If somebody could do it at a club beginner's class, and somebody put a guy gets up and said, yeah, what about this? And you get in a bit... Yeah. You feel that you're the boss. But you're not really... Yeah. Yeah. So that's, I really appreciate that point of humility for you. So we've got about 15 minutes left. So I could, rather than me asking Sacramati more questions, I thought it would be nice to give you good people a chance to ask him some questions. Um, and if anybody at home wants to write in, then feel free. How do you stay connected to that? Could you repeat this for several people? How do you stay connected to that sense of mystery and wonder in your everyday practice? How do you do it in everyday practice? How do you, yeah. how do you stay connected to it? Um, well, sometimes you just repeat your mind, and all these things are going in. <laughs> but it's um, what's going on. That's a, just a simple one. Yeah. 
you know, you sit down to meditate sometimes, and uh, sometimes you feel a bit of bliss. Mm. You know, and you think, well, that's a mystery. Because it's not going to come when you want it. Mm. <laughs> So that's one tip. Have you got any other tips? Um, what for? Just kind of step, well, you know, this, we've been evoking this sense of like mystery and wonder what else helps you stay in touch with that? Um, well, to meditate, yeah. to study. Yeah. Um, the nature. Mm. Um, I loved it when I moved up to Virgin Kuta. Yeah. To try and, uh, this is a retreat centre in North yeah. Wales. Yeah. Um, so this is another story, right? Yeah. So when we went to Tuscany, yeah. right, I went with them. There's a few of us went together. And the last night we were in there, what's it called? Um, it's a little touristy place, you know, beach bit place. And there, there's where we got the bus to go to the uh, Il Convento. Yes. Um, and I was keen on photography, so I'm going along the beach, the sun's going down, I'm taking a photograph. And I turned around and there's this, young blonde girl standing there and my legs went. Ah. I, I really, I just, and we talked to one another like it was, you know. Um, but luckily I was going on a retreat and she was going with her friends next day. But I mentioned it to Bucky. Um, and I said, uh, what was she ever said? Um, I said, what's wrong with that? I felt like I was in Diana. He said, fine, it's great. He said, but the thing is, you see the cause has been out there. Hmm. Um, and he said, and then you've got to create it within yourself. Mm. So I said, what do I do? Meditate more and all that. I said, oh, he said two things. Um, go to art galleries and he mentioned a few things. And um, the thing was, uh, you must experience your organic oneness with nature. Ah, yeah. yeah. So just to unpack that, so you must experience your organic oneness with nature. Yeah. So what does that, what does that mean to you? Um, well, the only time I felt I got what he meant was that I, well, I usually have a month or two in Kuka Loka. Mm. And uh, I, like, I, like, I just like being in, out in the country, probably like in the mountains and all. And um, a couple of times I can get like a, uh, I suppose it's what you're looking for in meditation. Huh. And you just realize there's not with separation. Huh. Yeah. I, I suppose that's the way. It's like you're, the trees are around. Um, you know, I mean, you blow in the fir trees and all that. I don't know see them. Maybe it's a bit tough. I don't know. But, mm. but, it, it, but it has an effect on you. Oh, of, yeah. Of well, you feel you, uh, you're, you're from nature. Yeah. I mean, that's what the, um, I don't know, when another does the thing, he says, well, uh, you know, all you're made up of, everything you're made up of is from out there. Yeah. And it belongs there. Yeah. It doesn't belong to you. Yeah. So, have we got a question from home? Yeah. Yeah. Not yet. Not, Not yet. yet. Okay. You've got a question. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, how do you relate to the emergence of uh, things like secular Buddhism or trying to remove uh, ideas of like ritual or um, those kind of elements of, of Buddhism? Yeah. Yeah. Stephen Batchelor. Yeah, yeah. There was a big argument between Anario and him. Huh? Uh, well, the thing is, does it work or not? I mean, um, some people are not into ritual. That's fine. Yeah. Um, but I think, from what I've understood, I've been to a couple of his lectures. Um, there's something missing. What Bhante would call a transcendental object. Mm. Right? I mean, I went to see Bhante at Madhya Loka and uh, I said, uh, Bhante, when I do a seminar on the three jewels, uh, you talk about the unconditioned. And I go, you know, it's wrong. Mm. I said, the Buddha makes it very clear. It's, it's mm. wrong. I said, the unconditioned, this means unconditioned by great end delusions. Mm. And even the word unconditioned doesn't do a bit of Sanskrit. Mm. It just means that the, 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 the karmic process of the Greek uh, samsara are not there. Mm. That's all it means. They're not mm. conditioned by it. Mm. Um, and he agreed, but then he rang me up a week later, because we used to have this study team at uh, Maji Maloka. Mm. Uh, and he said, well, the problem is, um, to live the spiritual life fully, you've got to have this feeling that there's something beyond you. Mm. 
right? So if you just think it's just you doing it, he said, that's so you've got to have a feeling there's something other yeah. that you can't imagine, like with the Buddha, yeah. you, can't, you can't imagine these things. So you've got to be open to a, a kind of the mystery of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but he said, well, for most people, um, if you're drawn to some particular Buddha or Bodhisattva or whatever, some people might think that just getting rid of Dukkha might be enough, but you've got to have something beyond you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it makes you more kind of open, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he so he calls it a transcendental object. Mm -hmm. and there's something like the Buddha, yeah, you know, the Gandhi, that's what like the Gandhi said, even the Buddha was awake and he thought there was something, yeah, there. So that's that sense of mystery, and yeah, something, yeah. yeah. Why should there be a, a reason? <laughs> yeah. Well, human beings are obsessed with reasons, but that's not to say that there is yeah. one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Sean, how do you stop the, the, the want of knowledge just becoming like a, a craving for information? How is it more used? How it develops? How does it develop in me? As in, like, say for me, I, I like books, I like reading. It's just buying books and reading them and not actually being able to use the information. Yeah. How do you stop that? How do you, what, do you um, limit your information? Or? Well, a lot of reading, even with this book, it's not, um, it's just information. You know, it's, it's keeping you in that world, you could say. Um, So that's why I, I personally have gone back to the Pali kind of bit more, mm. um, especially the early stuff, like yeah, the Sutta Nipata, the, the chapter of the AIDS. Yeah, it's a very different world. It's like, um, it seems to be a world that um, it's still in the forest. Yeah. I mean, the Buddha doesn't make any claims, which you get in later tradition. Uh, and we've got to sort out what's called hagiography. Right. So I'll give you a good example. So the Buddhist men have a wife and child. Mm. Um, and the child is called Rahula. But I've looked it up and um, there's no, in the cities, you've got the, the child. But when the Buddha left home, mother and father wept and that was it. And the first reference to Rahula is in uh, literature that is maybe a couple of hundred years after the Buddha. Mm. And the, it's a, the, it, what's it, the thing says, um, it's again, the Buddha's leaving home, but he's meant to have a, and somebody comes up and says, your wife's had a child. Hmm. And the Buddha says, um, a demon has been born, a fetter is born. That's what he says. And a Rahu is the demon. Yeah, and you see, in the Pali Sutta, in the Samyutta Nikaya, there is this yaka called Rahu, and he, want, he always wants to destroy the sun and the moon and things like that. Hmm. So why would you call your son after that, the la is just a diminutive, mm. yeah, so it doesn't change the meaning. So why would you call your son Rahu, a demon? So the thing is, all these stories have probably been added. Mm. And the thing is, in India, um, in the case of a male, a male has to leave a child, especially a boy, mm. to do the rituals when he dies, so that he can go to the realm of the fathers or the deva realm, right? So the Buddha, when things moved up the forest into society, they had to give the Buddha an appeal to the ordinary people. Mm. So he did the right thing. Before he, you know, he got married and never left his son. Mm. Yeah, that's the right thing to do. So it's probably all just made up. So this is one, of course, this is one of the ironies because in our culture, abandoning your child is seen as being a not okay thing to do, and people are very critical of the Buddha of this. And what you're saying is that actually, in that culture, it was fine to leave home, but you had to have had a son. And then yeah. once you've had the son, you can go off and do yeah. what you want. Yeah. So you, this is an example of different cultures. Do you, do you see what I mean? So in that culture, he's the child's being written in, mm -hmm. and in our culture, it looks really bad. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's, it's mm -hmm. just the whole thing's made up. But what you're also saying is that there wasn't actually... Sorry? But you're also saying what we're beginning to learn is that there wasn't actually a child. No. Yeah. He didn't abandon He didn't have a child. Because he never had one. No. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah that's, that's a kind of romantic tale that's been had yeah. long, yeah. Yeah. saying yeah. wife and child. Yeah. But at the same time, in that fantasy of the wife and child, 
there's an important, maybe you could elucidate on the, or elaborate on this more, but there's an important element of, uh, if you do have a wife and child, or you have a family, whatever shape it takes, or whatever context, it doesn't mean you can't practice. Hmm. Yeah. But you need to, but you do need to go beyond this to yeah. deeply practice yeah. in your body. Yeah. But the thing is, with, um, in the Udana, there's a case of a, a guy had left his wife and child, right. Right? and he's sitting under a tree meditating, and then his wife comes up, puts a baby in front of him, and he goes away. <laughs> and then he looks back, and he's not paying it any attention. So to us, that's ridiculous to, to do that. But his body said, well, yeah, but you're in India. You know, they're huge families. You know, when I was in India, you see the, 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 the older girls look after the, the, the younger girls, you yeah. know. The mother and father don't see them that much. Mm -hmm. So in an extended family, if you were to go and leave it, it wouldn't be such a big deal that our family is really yeah. going to be tragic. You know, yeah. they're, 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 different values at different times. Different values in a different social context yeah. in a different yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. Well, the Buddha did have a rule that, um, because younger people were joining the Sangha and uh, the, you know, the mothers were in the family were complaining. So he made it a rule that they ask, that before they're 21, I think it is, they have to ask their mother's permission to do it. Mm -hmm. So that was fair enough. I don't know the, the real age. I think Maybe we should bring that in. If you want to join the tree rabbit with the story, you have to ask your parents' permission. <laughs> 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 so we've just got a couple of minutes left. Um, so maybe, Sagamati, if you could say, so what one message for these good people to take with them? What, yeah, because over this whole, you know, you've all this experience, you've had a practice of Dharma, what's the most single, most important thing? Um, have good friends. It's oh. often mentioned again that the, the, the basic starting point is you have to have good friends. Carry on the Yeah, yeah, that's the most important thing. Why is that other, so important? Well, otherwise it's very difficult because oh. often you need support. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you talk to a friend, and you know you're back online because mm. if you're on your own all the time like that, it's quite difficult. Oh, yeah. So I think that's the most important thing is to have good friends. And this is one of the things that I mean with that Lando Lundrup. Mm. Um, what he said was, what we have that most other people don't is a sangha. Mm. Yeah? Mm. You know, because at other places, you're all looking at the guru. You know, they come along and they get teaching, but they, um, they don't sort of keep company after the class so much. Mm. Yeah. Whereas we are much more... Sangha, like Sangha is yeah. That's where we, we, we chant the shrine. It's not Sangha, it's Sangha. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I did a bit of Sanskrit. I, I was like, sort of like, You've done more than a bit. You've done a lot. Yeah, never no, mind. Yeah. So thank you for coming this evening, Sakramati. Hopefully you all enjoyed this. Do feel free, as, as we're leaving, to come up to Sakramati. And if you've got a little question you want to ask, him, then feel free to do that. Mm -hmm. But I just... Um, well, yeah, I just, I just really appreciate this opportunity to just hear. Well, I, th I think one of the things I get from you, which gives me a lot of confidence, is that you've really looked into what Buddhism actually says. Mm -hmm. And with this, you know, hopefully you've had a bit of it, like Sacramento is not afraid of being controversial or disagreeing with things. Mm -hmm. So then it gives me a lot of confidence to hear you say that, oh, it's a mystery. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, it's about beauty and friendship. Because it's like Sacramento is... Mm -hmm. Like he, he really cares about getting to the truth. So he's not like, he's not a wishy-washy kind of, it's no. all like, oh, maybe you've got a little bit of that at the heart of you, but you've really, you've, you're really confident of that. So I hopefully, I really hope that you can take that away with you. So I'd just like to say, thank you for joining us this evening. Mm -hmm. It's been great to have you here. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.